I'm doing a piece which is kind of hard, and I made some effort in actually making sure that I'll know most of it. Okay? So out of some sort of uh, sense of respect, at least to me, for making the effort for you, please turn off your cell phones. Also, please, you can power off. But well, you don't have to put the power off. You can all go on hum. I, I'll live with hum. Okay. Hum, 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 hum. But, but, Okay, yes, please. Uh, that, that's uh, yeah, that, that's uh, whatever munchy crunchy you have in your mouth is here for the next ten minutes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Then there'll be plenty of time to eat more later. Don't worry. No one is going to steal the food while you're sitting somewhere. I'll make sure of that. Okay. You don't believe me? Fine. That's good. Okay. Now. Okay. I'm only going to do two pieces. The second one is actually with Mary Earlbutt, and she was kind enough to write me a flute part for that one. But the first one is the piece, the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn by Claude Debussy. Okay. Now, you obviously see we don't have an entire orchestra here. Well, that's really, thank you for that, but I need the lights. Thank you. Uh, but, but, but it's just me, because some man named Arthur Fenbach decided he would make it just for flute. So you'll just have to imagine the rest of the orchestra when I play this piece. <laughs> this is a wonderful piece. It was inspired by a wonderful poem by Mallarmé, the French poet, all about how a fawn is sort of lolling about in the field, half asleep and half awake, and deciding whether he made it with either one, two, or three different nymphs. He's not quite sure of what. It's the poem. Okay, now if you want a visual interpretation of this, of course, many years ago there was a movie called Blow Up. And there was a side theme about the photographer making it with either two nymphs or a third nymph, okay, played by Vanessa Redgrave. And my father, I took my father to that because it was a mystery to me, he says, oh my god, that's the Mallarmé poem. That's it. The entire, the entire film is the Mallarmé poem explained. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it all fits line by line. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Debussy wrote a tone poem on this. And actually, his first version had a lot more flute. It's famous for the opening flute part. And then he asked the orchestra, who he hired to play through, to make orchestration suggestions. This is unusual. And so they all wrote down, and so the flute was still there, but a lot less, and a lot more other instruments, too. And there was a man who actually played the first version of that. His name was Marcel Moise. He was a French flutist who, because of the problems in World War II, ended up uh, teaching flute in New Hampshire or in Vermont or wherever. He was a nasty man, but he was a great flute player. Okay. <laughs> there we have it. Okay, I think I've given you all the need to know for this piece. So. Quietly happy. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I played this piece. Actually, I should mention that this was also a very famous ballet, which basically made the career of Nijinsky. <laughs> That's right. Uh, of course. And cell phones off, people. All new arrivals. Cell phones off. $5 for the model. That's right, $5 for the model. I'll collect from all of you. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Doesn't matter, I'm the model. I'll play the flute. It's a skilled thing. Okay, now, Nijinsky was famous because at the end of his dance with this, he had a drape that he pulled between his legs and looked as if he was achieving ecstasy. And this, 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 was, this, was, this was the twerking scandal of 1912 in Paris. That's right, oh absolutely, that did it, because he pulled it between his legs. Oh no, you see, I'm telling you now. Okay? Come here for an education. Okay, now listen. Everybody listen. The next piece we're going to do is actually by Nat King Cole through Miles Davis, and it's called Nature Boy. And we're doing Nature Boy because several days ago I was asked to participate in the birthday of Knox Martin, okay, who teaches up at the league, and uh, he's 92. And he has a loyal following of students, all average age about 70. And they're all young ones, he's 92. And he, I remember him from a number of years ago. He asked me to come because he likes to tell a story about his feats of his youth, and no one wants to believe him. And I'm there to tell the people, his students, that indeed it was true he really did this. I witnessed it. And what it was was he was at the Yale Summer School in Norfolk, Connecticut, teaching art, and to impress the young ladies there, he climbed into a tree, and he did more than just climb into a tree, he began to swing from branch to branch, and he made his way from one tree to another tree, covering the distance of about a quarter of a mile. Okay, it was quite something to see. Now Knox, in his youth, looked like a combination of Robert Mitchum and Victor Mature. He was very good looking. He still is good looking. I mean, I need to, okay, I mean, I know, but he was, he was very good looking. He also hardly ever said a word. So for women, they love this. Okay? He had bedroomy eyes like Victor Mature. He would barely grunt. And of course, he could swing from tree to tree, you know, just like that. Now, of course, they expected him, once he got down from the tree, that he was going to recite poetry or something. But of course, he was completely exhausted, and his face was all scratched up, and that was that. But of course, I'm there to tell these students about what he did. That's it. So I decided at the time to do Nature Boy, because of course, he was being Nature Boy. That's it. Of course, this song has nothing to do with Nature Boy in that sense. Yes, the nerd. I want to make sure they have their cell phones off. Please and have we're going to do Nature Boy, which is a short piece. But, so if you could just sit down and not be serving yourself, you'll be yes, able to have right. 10 minutes now, to serve yourself afterwards. In okay. this case, the tune is written by, by uh, Nat King Cole, but it has some alterations by Miles Davis oh, in that version. And my part, my part in this, is written by the soprano, Mary Hurlbut. She yeah. wrote it because I'm incapable of doing things like that, but Mary is quite capable of doing it. Okay, and then yay Mary, okay, yay Mary, okay. Here we go now. Do you want anything from me? Nothing, okay. Here we go, okay. Now people, please. Thank you. Okay, put something in your mouth. Okay, so everybody has something in their mouth. Okay, chew gently, okay? Gently, if it's crunchy, don't crunch. If it's nice and soft, you can just kind of hold it in your mouth and let it sort of dissipate a little bit, you know, and savor the flavors. Okay. Thank you. Quietly happy.
when I realized that authors do what painters do, composing an image of life by describing events, persons, places, relationships, or conflicts. The writer interweaves parts, stacking or opposing elements, with or without transitions, repetitions, or symmetries, distorting perspective, making things more colorful than they are, dulling down, making ambiguous, fuzzy, sentimental, or outrageous. <laughs> Once there is a theme, everything falls into place, even as new materials seep into the consciousness of the writer, demanding to be a part of the story. Painters, though, since they are solitary, tend to fall in the direction in which they are inclined, indulging themselves in their private worlds, whereas writers and pros follow their inclinations with the audience in mind, hoping to hear the sound of two hands clapping, not just one. In a New Yorker article years ago, Richard Diebenkorn posited that Matisse had probably started one particular painting of a figure by making a rough sketch in which the hands were drawn in a few rhythmic strokes close to the center of the canvas. Matisse then painted the whole image around the hands, Diebenkorn argued, because he never again dealt with those first rhythmic lines, rather leaving them as they were when they, he first put them into the canvas, onto the canvas. The hands became the initial statement to which all elements had to conform. I have followed this compositional device by constructing my next memoir piece, Airmen Before, During, and After Vietnam, around a rhetorical question uttered by Virginia Admiral 
to my St. Louis friend, Alice Chun, in 1979 at the dinner table in Virginia's loft on the corner of Spring Street and Lafayette in Soho, New York City. One, Buddy Forrester, quote, my hands were cold and clammy, end of quote. My weekly writing assignment began. It was written in 1954 for Mrs. Augusta Gottlieb's 11th grade English class at University City Senior High School. Mrs. Gottlieb loved the piece, which went on to describe how nervous I felt when at home alone, I watched from a window as Buddy Forrester got out of his car and walked towards the front door of our house on Northmore Drive. My mother had painted the door deep periwinkle to indicate that there were veritable daughters inside the house. <laughs> I opened the door. I my mother was right now. I opened the door. Buddy came and asked me how everyone was. We didn't sit down during our short conversation. Instead, we stood leaning on my mother's grand piano near the front hall. He had just got back from a journey and was my sister home. He promised to come back later. Mrs. Gottlieb submitted my assignment to the committee that chose pieces to be published in the school's yearly journal. It was rejected for being, in the words of the committee, too purple, in the sense, in the sense of my having exposed my feelings too much and my having tried too hard to manipulate the sympathies of the reader. The definition of purple prose must have changed over the years, or maybe there is so much good current prose that would have been considered purple years ago that the term now indicates the use of elaborate and flowery language. I have never used flowery language, so the committee's complaint could not have been my choice of words. But I agreed that the piece was embarrassing for me and anyone else who might read it. Mrs. Gottlieb was disappointed by the committee's rejection, but I was relieved that Buddy Forrester would never see written proof that I had a crush on him. <laughs> he was an extraordinarily handsome 20-year-old who wanted to fly. Everyone knew that airplanes were his passion and that his eyesight was not good enough for him to enlist in the U.S. Air Force, in the US Air Force as a fighter pilot. I didn't like to read and write in high school or college. I only liked art and music. Reading literature was a chore and writing was a torture. I had nothing to say. The piece I wrote about Buddy's visit was the exception. It flowed out of me easily. I loved Mrs. Gottlieb, as did the rest of the students in our class. So I paid attention to her and tried to please her. University City High School administrators tracked, <coughs> tracked students, and Mrs. Gottlieb happened to have got the bright students for our class of 1956. Her lessons have had more staying power with me than any other teachers. Sixty years later, I can still see the sign resting on the blackboard ledge in her classroom. Quote, all great books were written this morning. <laughs> she also had on constant display an image of Joan of Arc painted and scumbled on a narrow piece of cardboard with a palette knife depicting the saint looking up and standing in full armor with her arms crossed over her heart as though in a spiritual daze. Painted by a student four years earlier, it became an aesthetic standard against which we younger students evaluated our expressive artistic abilities. But it also let us know that she cared deeply about her students' artistic productions as well as their thoughts. <coughs> I can picture her, already late middle aged, slightly overweight, standing in front of the class holding a small book, Tennyson's Idols of the King, and reading, we needs must love the highest when we see it was a warning about the choices that we students would be making as soon as adults. We should choose the virgin Arthur over the disloyal Lancelot. The old order changes, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in, ma in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world, informed us about <coughs> the difficult nature of things beyond our control. Good leaders will die and good regimes will end, but in the long run, it is all for the best. Clearly, she liked literature with a moral, especially long Russian and British novels with complex plots where everyone gets their come up into the end. For American novels, we read The Scarlet Letter and Ethan Frome. Mrs. Gottlieb also said often, in a circus barker's voice, you pays your money and you makes your church. When she said it, I thought it was a simple warning like, be careful what you wish for. You might get it and be unhappy. But over the years, I've realized that it is, a, it is essentially an existentialist axiom, not a warning at all. You are responsible for everything you do. If you take responsibility for the consequences of an act, paying for it, that others think is criminal, then it is not criminal. Kristen Lavin's daughter by Norwegian novelist Sigrid Unstedt was a staple. I remember being alone with Mrs. Gottlieb only once. Probably after class one day, I asked her about Kristen Lavin's daughter. I wanted to know if she agreed that two young persons 
making love before marrying, had no right to do so. And she thought of, of that act, and if she thought of that act as a crime for which uh, each participant would be and probably should be punished. Yes, she said, perhaps in some well-intentioned attempt to keep me, <coughs> to help me to preserve my virginity. It was very wrong, and no, implicitly, do not even think about having sex anytime soon. Mrs. Gottlieb had an ongoing rivalry with an English literature teacher from Clayton High School about educational philosophy. He assigned only literature that was appropriate to the age group that he taught, writings that were nearly totally comprehensible. Writings uh, only that he taught, writings that were nearly totally comprehensible to a high schooler's mind at the present. Mrs. Gottlieb believed in the deep freeze method, confronting the students with novels and poems that they could not possibly totally understand. She wanted us to send her postcards in the years to come throughout our lives, telling her that we had finally understood something that we had read in class with a new clarity, such as Dorothea's odd behavior when dividing her with her younger sister her mother's jewelry at the start of Middle March. She wasn't expecting postcards like, quote, I now understand the pain that Anna Karenin had felt, and I'm on my way to the subway now. This was quite the doll's house with one of her favorites, and it got as close to scary as Mrs. Gottlieb ever got. Maybe she didn't realize how prophetic the play was. Maybe she saw Nora as being atypical, by chance forced to see her life for what it was, and happily having had the courage to try to change herself. Who could have imagined in the 50s that educated American women would follow in Nora's footsteps and, and walk out of their dollhouses 20 years later? <laughs> I don't know why I'm crying. It's a little funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what happened don't to Buddy? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that could be. Okay. Buddy got a job. Buddy got a job. Flying for Midwestern Airlines. He oh. married. Wait a minute. I haven't got the Buddy. I'm yet. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry
We fought with words a little. He held his ground, and I stopped loving him. <laughs> <laughs> so those are three of my flyers. Um, mm -hmm. Buddy Forrester, uh, Lady Gregory's son, and Casey Lambert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Susan Young. Hi. Good job. I know it. There's a high period. I think
we are all privileged to listen and have time in this time of our life to listen to the great Mary Mathieu who has been recording and say it again, Minerva, for 68 years. And that is one of her best songs. And we want to thank Minerva again for a wonderful night. Yeah. And now we have from Mexico, my good friends, my wonderful friends. We work together, we model together. Latisha and Esteban. <laughs> so we are we are like from spring to
shows you better aim than you do it. Well, let her do it now. Because when I go up to the stage, she's like, you go into it.